things to say about Binyavanga and his work. Um, I'm just going to say a minute's worth of things. I, I could speak uh, as a famous um, uh, scholar, Karen Barber, once said about the Yoruba language, I could speak until tomorrow about uh, Binyavanga Wainaina for sure. But, but just to say that I, I met him in 03, I think. I knew him um, in person in many places, in many ways. All of them were blessings. Some of them were hard. <laughs> Some of them were easy, but um, all of them a pleasure in a certain way. And just to say that, you know, in, in Binyavanga Wainaina on the page, no matter what page, no matter what genre, and in person, no matter what room, no matter what occasion, I knew I was in the presence of a, of a, of a being, of a person who seemed to have the action in each cell of his body to open the world in more ways to more people at once than, than anything I've ever encountered in my life. I, I just felt in traveling with him, I was really traveling in a very different dimension than I could do by myself, that I could do in any other company. Um, and that was true on sailboats alone in the Indian Ocean, as well as in huge literary events, traveling alone in a car up on a mountainside in Colorado, it didn't matter. That man beamed, um, something about our capacity for openness and togetherness in this world. It could be messy, but it was possible. And, you know, he, he did make it possible in all kinds of ways for all kinds of people. And, and, and I consider myself, you know, one of those people and, and very blessed to be one of those people. So, so I'll carry him ahead in any way I can in my limited way. And I'm, I'm always, um, it's always wonderful to at least even imagine myself in the company of others to do the same. And, and I know I'm in that space now. So that's where we are. And that's what I, I hope uh, we're here to do. And thanks to all y'all listening as well. All right. Peace, everybody. Thank you, Ed. Um, and now we'll go to Julia Tonyon, who's joining us from Paris. Julia is a project coordinator at Council which is a Paris-based arts organization. And she is the co-editor of the Against Nature Journal, which uh, if you haven't seen it, might just be the smartest small magazine you haven't yet read. Julia and her colleagues, especially Aymar Ariola, chose to make uh, Binyavanga the centerpiece of their inaugural issue a few months ago. And uh, I'd like to invite her to tell us how her interest and the Against Nature Journal's interest in Binyavanga came about. Hello, Julia. Thank you, Ashal. Thank you, Ed, uh, Adam, and the Boston Review for co-hosting this event. Um, and thank you to my co-editors, Aymar Ariola and Gregory Castera, uh, who uh, are not here today, but without whom the Against Nature Journal wouldn't exist. We are super proud to be part of this and very thankful because what was just a suggestion to Ashal a few months ago now is an event with uh, many, many people so and amazing speakers. So. Thank you so much. And um, I think we're also very happy because this gathering confirms that there's a shared desire to discuss certain perspectives and especially certain authors that we um, wanted to give space to in the Against Nature Journal. So it's, it's amazing to like see you here. Um, first, just a couple of words on, for those who are not familiar with the publication, um, the Against Nature Journal, which is, this is the inaugural issue that we published last summer, um, is a biannual magazine by Council, as Charles was, uh, was saying, and is published in Paris. And it was really born out of the desire to explore uh, the so-called Against Nature laws. So those laws that still punish uh, same-sex relations and non-normative ways of being in the world in more than 70 countries. And we wanted um, to just acknowledge a global conversation that is happening about the pre both the present and the legacies of those laws that have colonial origins, but are have like huge impact on the lives of like million of LGBT people um, in the world. So we decided to print each issue in 2000 copies and half of which are sent around the world to people who are active in advancing change in human rights and also who are just supporting um, people affected by these laws and contributing to the cultural discussions around it also. Um, but 
we come from the arts um, as a background and we really wanted to like create a bridge between disciplines through printed matter. Um, and we, so we decided to gather authors and readers from law, activism and social sciences and the arts and trying to think together what this, what, what this concept of nature could mean today and how um, change can happen. And so for us, this meant including featuring legal analysis and academic papers, but also really like uh, poetry, journalism, visual arts, and of course, fiction. And I guess one of our questions when we started this project was like, can fiction and creative writing be used as arguments for litigation, for example? Um, so I, I don't think we have the answer yet and hopefully with more issues uh, coming, we'll have greater feedback. Um, but the publication of Binguni was really strongly re related to building up the project because the passing of Binyavanga Wainaina was really caught us in the preparation of the first issue. And we didn't have a clear uh, structure of what it was going to be like, but we really decided to give him a central uh, space as a tribute to his uh, work and life. Um, and with the modest ambition of spreading the knowledge of his work to fields in which maybe he was not so known. Um, we commissioned uh, writer Amatiziro Dore, a story about his work, which I invite you also to check out on our website. It's a, it's a beautiful introduction to his uh, life and work and, and captures very like brilliantly so many nuances of, of his practice. Um, but we really determined to republish one of his pieces. Um, because we felt that many activists also and people in the advocacy world knew about him, but maybe hadn't read uh, his writing and especially the fiction. Um, so the encounter with Ashal really came into this uh, sort of research process and he's been instrumental in making Binguni appear on paper. Um, and I think Ashal, we can say we've been the first one to, to print uh, to print Binguni after the, the sort of its, its rediscovery, um, which we're super, super proud of. Um, and Ashal uh, really found the perfect story to match our inaugural issue, which was about sort of the entanglements between spirituality, religion, and activism. And Binguni looked just at some point just appeared as really the perfect match because it was this weird story about this pagan heaven full of like bizarrely characterized ancestors so we're like wow this is really perfect um and i just yeah i just want to like um keep the conversation going and and just to conclude really thanking ashal for this invaluable for his invaluable work and contribution and uh, which really attest, as we uh, were speaking uh, about the other day, to really the importance of all these intermediary figures um, in the publishing world, like editors and translators who do like an incredible work and, and, and really make, uh, make this, uh, make the, just contribute to making um, like a polished piece of writing appear in a magazine or on a website. So um, yeah, thank you, Ashal. Um, and um, I'm really excited to, for the conversation to continue. So I leave you the floor and maybe you can tell us a bit more about how uh, this rediscovery of Binguni happened. Thank you. Thank you, Julia. Um, I, I would love to do that. Uh, if you haven't read the story, uh, there's a short introduction that accompanies it on the Boston Review website, and I, I write there of how it came to be, uh, which was quite strange. Uh, Binyavanga wrote to me at the end of 2017 in what was uncharacteristically a despondent tone to talk about this story that he had written, which was then lost and he couldn't find. He was nostalgic about it because it was the first story he ever wrote. Characteristically, however, he said that it was published on a website called purification.com, uh, which doesn't exist. 
is also a great name for a future literary magazine somewhere <laughs> that <laughs> deals with spirituality and homosexuality. Uh, however, but the uh, but it turned out after a lot of searching, um, I was meanwhile somewhat on the skids in terms of my friendship with him. By the way, uh, the reason I'm here, in case you're, you're wondering, I live in Bangalore, I, I write, but I, I primarily work as a public health activist. And, you know, by all reasons, I actually have no right to be here, except that I was a friend of his. I still have difficulty saying that. I, I think I am a friend of his. I know that he was alive, but uh, it's difficult to say that in the past tense uh, because he lives a lot in my head. Uh, I was very keen to make up with him and do something for him. And so when he wrote asking for this story and clearly seemed dejected that it might be lost forever, I tried really hard. That at first involved looking through African water purification projects, which I, look, I, I too was a little incredulous that they might have published experimental fiction, but you know, it was the 90s. Anyway, uh, it then, you know, deep, deep, deep dive several weeks later into the bowels of the internet led me to uh, something that might have been what he was talking about, purefiction.com, which was, it turned out, a surprisingly vibrant hub of new writing where Binyavanga had contributed this piece. And so I actually had to trawl on the internet archive, which is one of the greatest inventions of uh, humankind, to through every piece submitted on, the, uh, on purefiction.com over several months, because he only had a year. Um, and I found it and it was fantastic. And I really felt like such a discovery. I called him up in the middle of the night. I sent it to him on email. I called him back just to make sure we had 10 conversations, very, very excited by it. You know, the remarkable thing about the story, Binyamanga wrote it when he was 25. I think in a more sophisticated world, honestly, if I read that story, if I had you know, power uh, of any kind, I would have given him a book contract immediately and he would have become the greatest writer in the universe at 26. Uh, it is an incredible story. I, 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 you know, if I could be even a tenth as sophisticated as, as him when I was 25, I would have been lucky, but I wasn't. The, the, it, it's just remarkable. I, I, I am kind of stunned even reading it today. I, uh, I'm also stunned by how much of his early work was on the early internet. Reading Binguni is a bit like looking at these fan pages. I don't know if you've been, I have weird habits. And one of those habits is to go to pages that look like the internet of the 90s. So you can go to pages that look like GeoCities, um, you know, personal pages with flashing graphics and things like that. It's really quite remarkable. A lot of Binyavanga's early writing was on such websites, on Pure Fiction, which I didn't even know about, but also on another website called G21. Uh, G21 was a global magazine that was run out of uh, New Orleans, uh, run by um, the most remarkable, uh, uh, rem re remarkable editor who actually paid people in, con you know, con who contributed to it, who kicked off the careers of a large number of writers, who published the story "Discovering Home" that won Binyavanga the Kane Prize, which he had to argue with the Kane Prize jury about because this was what the early two thousands, um, and they said uh, you published it on the internet. I'm sorry, that doesn't count. Um, and he said, well, you said publish it in a magazine, and I did. And he got his way, and he won the prize, and that was because of G21. G21 doesn't exist anywhere. Pure fiction doesn't exist anywhere. None of these things exist at all. And this story, you know, we did really light copy editing to it, but it is good to go. It's, it was just perfectly formed. And for sure, Binyamanga did not have an editor, or he did not have an intermediary. This was a site where you just uploaded things that you had written and its perfection uh, sort of astonishes me, actually sort of angers me even. I think that reading it, you just feel a lot of love, but also just pure envy for its uh, incredible perfection. Thank you for being here. Um, we're going to now start off with uh, our extremely lovely and exciting speakers. And the first is Neo. Neo Sinoktolo Musangi is an independent queer feminist. Their work life is in art, academia and creative writing. Neo, welcome. Now, uh, apart from being a long-standing friend of Binyavanga, you also took a spiritual journey together, a journey that is intimately tied to the subject of this wonderful story, Binguni. And perhaps I'm mistaken about this, but I think his interest in spirituality, in the afterlife, in the ancestors, wasn't something that he always wore on his sleeve. Uh, what was the journey like for you? and? What is it like now uh, reading Binguni after all these years? 
Um, thank you, Acha. So first, it feels really strange to speak about Binyavanga in his absence, uh, in his physical absence. So I'm quite nervous. And um, if you allow me, uh, dear Binyavanga, whatever I say here, you can't use it against me. And I hope that it's okay to say the things that I'm going to say now. Um, so yeah, I hope this is fine. So Binyavanga and I did not know each other for as long as probably Ed and him knew each other or you or a lot of many other people. But I think in his later years, the journey that you are speaking about came to me as kind of a surprise. So between the two of us, I was always the heathen. I was the one doing the crazy, notorious African spiritual things. And Binyavanga was the middle-class person who just didn't know what to do. He, he, was, he just couldn't even do his own family history. His genealogy was too complicated for him. And, and in many ways, he wished for a more clear path where um, this is my mother, this is my mother's mother, this is, and this is my story, this is my clan. So um, in later years, yeah, we did take a journey um, that was basically him wanting me to be a guide. And it was in me exclusively. He was in conversation with a couple of other people across the continent. Um, but I want to read, to share a thing that I think is really important in our understanding of Pinguni, or at least for my own processing of this story. So 2014, I want to live a life of a free imagination. Binyavanga Wainaina opens part one of six in a series of videos titled, We Must Free Our Imaginations. This is 2014. Binyavanga is free speaking. He is unrehearsed, funny and chaotic, especially chaotic as Binyavanga would be. But in this too muchness of being, Binyavanga keeps going back to the bankruptcy of imagination and this thing that he keeps calling demonology. In this series, he seems to be just chapai stories. His audience is clear. He speaks to a Kenyan audience that probably needs neither translation nor explanation. 2016, I am at the African Studies Association of the UK conference in Cambridge, pretending to be doing clever things. September 9th at 8.14 a.m. at the 56th second with no salutations, no small talk, no introduction, Binyavanga emails. Send me a manifesto of your feminist thoughts. What? <laughs> this is the kind of work that like Charles Darwin's on the origin of species would probably take me more than 40 years to write. 14 seconds later, Binyavanga is getting agitated and frustrated with my lack of response. Now he nudges. I have to send this thing to Documenta by midnight today. I am writing a story in which you are the main character. You are a Sangoma from Kaduna, Nigeria, and you are married to a transgender person, a he who is a she. What else do you want me to add on it? I tell Binyavanga to make him an alcoholic. He laughs. Okay, tell me about your childhood and your grandmother. So in this, we've moved from the feminist manifesto and I'm supposed to be talking about my childhood and my grandmother and this, this entire story that's happening in Nigeria. And everything is urgent in the way that everything was in the final years of Binyamanga's life. I ask him whether this can wait till the conference goes on lunch break. Binyavanga emphatically writes, no. I am very close to my emotions lately. Maybe it is close to dying. 
there's an urgency to write there was not before. So it is past Binyavanga's midnight deadline and the story is not up on the mentor. A few days later, he sends a draft of what he says is a letter to Nigerians to a couple of people. He has copied and pasted our private conversation in its entirety. No editing, no checking in on what can or not be public. I am pissed. I have been exposed. So to end this story, I tell this story not because of this falling in and out of love with Binyavanga's urgency and too muchness. I share this as a beginning point for thinking about what Binyavanga's life and writing made possible. I want to invite us into thinking not only of Binyavanga the man that he was, but to think of how his fiction expanded the possibilities of what it could mean to be human. He created characters, he created stories in languages that allowed us to exist in the full extent of our humanness, planetary, intergalactic, messy, flawed, carefree, and even careless, conflicted, feeling, and fleeting. Biguni could have been very easily the last thing that Binyavanga wrote, even before he fell in love with Nigeria and later South Africa, Binyavanga had always lived with the ancestors. Binya, may you always be a worthy ancestor. Live, Binya, live. Thank you. Neo, my gosh. Uh... I'm glad we started with you, I think, because if we've had you any later, I think we'd all be bursting out into tears. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I, um, I should just say, you know, speaking of ancestors, I um, want to acknowledge uh, the siblings who are here, um, especially James, uh, uh, Shiro, and Chiki, uh, Binamanga's siblings, uh, whose, whose, whose love of him sustained him through many of his uh, darkest days and last years, and it, whose love of him also has enabled uh, Binguni to be published uh, both at the Against Nature Journal and at the Boston Review. Um, so if you're here, James Chikishiro. All right, uh, next we have Aruni Kashyap. Uh, Aruni is an assistant professor of creative writing at the University of Georgia, the author of several acclaimed books. Aruni, um, I'm so happy to have you. Um, <laughs> And you're from partly because you're from the one part of India which might be even more marginal than the one I live in. Um, I live in Bangalore and I'm speaking to you from here and I'm South Indian. Always felt a little marginal to the nation, but Northeastern India where you grew up is uh, definitely even more marginal. And then there you are in the margins, uh, finding this writer thousands of miles away who you connected deeply to at multiple levels. And that writer was Binyavanga. So how did that come about? Thank you. Um... I just want to start by saying that it's an absolute honor uh, that I'm here. Uh, and uh, thank you, Neo, for sharing those uh, stories. Uh, it just, just filled my heart. And what a wonderful beginning to the conversation. Um, I'm the odd one out here, of course, uh, and, but I'm so happy to be here. I didn't have the great fortune of knowing Binyavanga Vainaina personally, uh, but his work has meant a lot to me uh, when I was um, just starting out you know, as a writer in Assam. Uh, in northeastern part of India. Um, I always wrote in two languages, but when I started thinking about uh, thinking about writing more seriously, writing, um, writing, moving to another country, thinking about doing doing creative writing, um, I was um, um, I found actually a lot of um, uh, affinity in, in in writers like Binyavanga Vainaina. But uh, I'm also probably part of this panel because my wonderful colleague. Um, Ed read one of my essays called How to Write About Not Just India, 13 Tips If You Are From Somewhere Else in India, which was inspired by Wainaina's famous viral essay, How to Write About Africa. But I, to be able to talk about this essay, I have to tell you two really tiny uh, stories about my life. Um, the first story is about failure, um, the failure of the Indian state. Uh, I grew up in Assam in Northeast India, as I said, 
which is one of the most misunderstood and misrepresented regions of India. Outside India, people don't really know what is not just India really all about. We have too many problems. It's a small region, but also we have hundreds of ethnic communities, languages, orchids, rivers, and numerous armed bloody insurgency movements against the Indian state. And that has really shaped most of my memory. Um, Assam, my state, um, often known for you know, uh, its tea and rivers, uh, has been ravaged by armed secessionist struggles that wants to secede from the Indian uh, nation state. So in many ways, it was the failure of the Indian nation, um, nation state that led to our the isolation and treatment as unequal citizens. Some, I say this because in some states in Northeast India, including mine, uh, there, there are different sets of laws that allows security forces to just arrest or detain anyone without a warrant, for instance. You can't do that in the other parts of the country. Um, we have been raising a lot of trouble uh, for the Indian government since 1947, it looks like. Uh, I write in two languages, uh, Assamese and English. Assamese is my native language. Uh, most of my fiction, nonfiction and poetry um, is about growing up uh, under such violence. Uh, but when I started seriously writing, as I said before, I, I couldn't find inspiration in Indian English writers, uh, except one or two writers. Um, and uh, I, think, I think the biography of every writer could be written if you start with who are the writers that impacted them. So if somebody ever thinks that, that I, they should write my biography, I think one I know would be one of those writers along with other writers who meant a lot to me while I was growing up. But coming back to the main point, reading the Indian English novel often made me infantilized and, and I felt almost like kicked out of the text. It was like trying to be in a Zoom conversation but being kicked out repeatedly because of bad internet. Um, the narrators, because in these novels, uh, uh, we're talking to somebody else, uh, not me. This was strange to me because I grew up reading Assamese, Hindi, and Bengali language fictions where the narrators told stories to people like me. Um, they, even though I loved a lot of the Indian English writers, most of the diasporic Indian English experience and represented in fiction was absolutely um, alien to me. And, and, and because also they were about upper class communities while I came from a much more humble background. Uh, for instance, um, you know, I'm the only one in my family who can speak, write in English, um, rest, uh, rest know the language, but to fill up government forms. Uh, my parents gave me the opportunity to go to a good English medium school, which meant they spent a lot of money on my education. Um, but it was, it was in Delhi University when I came to study uh, literature, I, I read writers like Ngudi Thiongo. Uh, and slowly, uh, I started reading contemporary African writing, which is not in my uh, college education. And Binia Vanga Vainaina was one of them. Um, and reading these writers, along with the fiction of um, African-American writers, um, such as Baldwin and Morrison, or Native American writers, such as Louis Edrich, they told me that my world of um, reverse reigns, very humble middle-class background, rural India, semi-urban India, was valuable and worthy of literature. Uh, you know, it was, I think, around 2007 when I was an undergraduate student. It was my uh, final year, final year, yes, uh, undergraduate student in Delhi University in the Department of English. Someone shared a copy of Discovering Home. It was a link, a very strange link. You know, right now it's in, it's in Chimurega Journal, but it was a white page, I remember. Um, you know, and we didn't have internet access like we do today. So, so, and, and, and I think it was about 40 rupees to pay for one hour. <laughs> so I went, I spent that 40 rupees to go and access the internet and I started reading it. Uh, and and I, it was something really sort of, it's hard to describe because I just felt that I was reading about a world that is familiar to me and the permission and the, uh, and the infantilizing experience that I had reading Indian English fiction that, that didn't seem to me. I, I felt that, you know, I'm, this is how I want to write about, you know, this is how I want to write. And already I had read Tiongo and HB and Bessie Head. And I realized that we are, I'm reading a writer who is writing in this tradition and who is great and who is young, you know, and, and whose footsteps probably I could follow because he was also, he was not Tiongo and HB. He was much younger, he was starting, you know. For me, it gave me a part that, you know, if somebody from Kenya can write this experience, and also it was, it was a story about going home, 
you know, and I was a migrant student. For me, it was very expensive to go home. Um, air uh, air aircraft was very, very expensive then. I'm talking just about just another minute. Sorry, just, just one minute warning. <laughs> oh yes, okay, all right. So in in many ways, actually, um, so where Indian English writing failed, um, my admiration for African and low phone writer began and. Uh, and after that, obviously, I discovered one day I write about this place, and it was like almost I'm saying that sentence, which further inaugurated a world and a created literary permission for me. So this writer, who was so far removed from rural small town conflict ridden Assam, felt absolutely close to home and gave me, told me that, that your experience is really worthy. The second story that I want to narrate is very short. So when How to Write About Africa went viral, I don't know if you used to use the word viral then, but it went viral like one while writing around 2019 or 2018, because it was published earlier than I think it was made online. So I knew that there'll be one angry day when I would write something similar, uh, a similar because a similar kind of racism and racial language describes people from North East and issues from North East all the time, even by well-meaning uh, people from mainland India, as we say, who write about North East Indian topics. But you know, what I learned is that to be able to tell truths. Sometimes, you know, a satirical piece is the only way. And, and, I, and, and I did that in February, 2020. And um, people, people uh, and, and then a magazine called Scroll published it. So this is my relationship with uh, Vinayavanga Vainana's work and it has given me the literary permission I required and encouragement and inspiration. While I was in Gohati, Assam, Googling uh, creative writing programs, Googling magazines where I could send, because there were no good magazines that I could find in India to send my work or email my work, you know? So, and all the magazines seemed so exclusive that they would never publish me. Um, and I published also in those, some online magazines during that time, which are defunct completely now. But, but, but reading and, and, and investigating the career parts of writers like Vidya Vangavanyana, he was one of the most important ones. Um, I think I think I'm who I am today is because I, I found Wainana's work. Thank you, Aruni. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, we now have uh, from another part of the world. We have Oris Ibo Kaiwulo, uh, a writer who won the 2015 All Africa Music Award for Journalism. Uh, Oris has contributed to a range of publications, including the London Review of Books, Catapult, the New York Review of Books, Chimurenga, the Africa Report and The Guardian. Uris, uh, among the many things that you have said and written about Binyavanga, the one thing that struck me very much exactly at the moment I think you wrote it uh, was, was this, and I'm going to read out from what you wrote then a couple of years ago. Do we have many writers like Binge on the continent? Not storytellers. We have a thousand of those per village now clutching slick Android phones, but writers, writers. Artists who take as canvas the word, the sentence, the paragraph. Folks who appear to be able to do anything because of an unspeakable mastery of the prose form. I was so excited when you wrote this, Oris, because um, I felt exactly the same. And that there was, in a way, less appreciation for Binyavanga's absolute mastery at English. You know, trying to edit him was trying to understand something called, you know, past continuous uh, tense that was written as though it was in the present. It, it was really the most impossible thing to do because his ability to turn language was was so incredible. I'd love you to speak more about that uh, and your relationship with his form and his craft. All right, uh, <clears throat> thank you very much and uh, hi to everyone. Uh, let me start. I think I met Biavanga, um, I don't remember, four, five, six years ago. I can't remember anymore. Well, a while, a while ago, so I think maybe within the past 10 years. Um, and at the time, I was attending a um, I was attending a writing workshop with um, Chimamanda, who was at DJ, who everybody I think was, um, and she she had invited him. I think as she did every year um, to take a part of it. I just remember that meeting him in person, he was like you know um, someone you'd met before, but of course I hadn't met him before. I just I just pretty much knew his work. And I think that that relationship with his work began uh, around 2002, 2003, around the time he won the uh, the Kim Prize. Um, I was living in a very small, small town uh, called Topoja in, uh, in Nigeria, in the middle belt of Nigeria. Um, and for some reason, I was a science guy. I'm still a science guy. I studied pharmacy in school. Um, for some reason, I. I kind of fell in love with uh, with writing, 
And I had a friend who was going to study literature, I think, in school. And she told me oh, that there was this award, uh, there was this award scheme, he came prize, and this guy from Kenya, um, I think that was in Uganda, but yeah, this guy from Kenya uh, had won the prize. And of course, I mean, something Arun really said just now was very popular to me, this whole idea of not a lot of internet, and so you have to pretty much pay for a particular amount of time. So I, uh, so we went to the internet cafe somewhere around town and printed out the winning story. And I remember how I felt just reading the very first sentence, and I don't think I've actually quite forgotten it. It was somebody has locked themselves in the bathroom, and bathroom or toilet, I can't remember the last word. But I remember that I was just struck by, 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 that, by those combination of words. I felt that all through my reading of um, literature, African literature, Nigerian literature, all of that, um, there are people who wanted to tell stories. A lot of them moralistic stories, a lot of the stories you're supposed to learn something from. I think one of our major um, storytelling platforms on TV at the time was something called Tales by Amolet, which was this story form where <clears throat> a guy would talk to a bunch of students, a bunch of um, kids, and at the end, they tried to like figure out what this lesson is to be learned from it. Somehow, I had, I felt, I mean, I was a kid, I was, I was maybe a teenager or something. Uh, I just felt that, you know, I had gone past that I didn't want to be the guy who is learning lessons from stories. So I was looking for something more. And unfortunately, I couldn't get that. I didn't think I could get that at least from a lot of the stories that we are supposed to be as students uh, studying English in school. But yeah, but Discovering Home, which is the story, and I really just mentioned it, um, struck me as particularly What's the word? I think, yeah, I think the word I have to use is sophisticated. I just felt like, you know, here was somebody who was using language in a way I felt like it needed to be used. So yeah, so fast forward about a decade or two about later when I met him in person. Um, of course, by this time, Yavanga was king. He was, he was literally the king of African literature, the king of the world. Um, so it was incredibly exciting to be in the same space um, as he was. And just hearing him talk, I mean, if anybody here, of course, has heard Yavanka talk, you know, he starts from something and then suddenly starts with this, with this entire whole thing. So we have uh, Chimamanda that brought him in to talk about writing, but some ideas that become, I mean, every night, because of course Yavanka was tireless. Uh, it was something about politics and about pop culture and about music, just everything, you know. And I found that in the writing, since the time I had I'd read him, he had become even more um devoted to using language um like like a paintbrush you know i felt like the avanga above everything else was somebody who pretty much used english um as painting you know he was somebody who was trying to create i wasn't I, i'm not quite sure that i read the avanga because i wanted to learn a lesson you know um i felt like somebody who even if he wasn't saying anything i just wanted to hear what he had to say you know, just because of how much of language he has. And I figured, and later, because of course, as it happens these days, you follow the person on Twitter, and on Facebook and everything. One of the times, I think 2013, he wrote something on uh, Facebook that struck me as just the exact way I thought about him as a writer, as somebody who didn't quite care a lot for, I mean, he respected the language. He respected people who had gone, be, who had gone, who had gone before him. But he also felt like he wanted to do a lot more with the language that he felt he had been bestowed or um, owned, courtesy of colonization. And if you give me two seconds, I will try to read um, the thing he wrote back then. Uh, but just a brief part of it. So he said, yeah, there is a sort of literary English that is African from a thousand school set books um, using proverbs and village centered imagery, Elia Chebe style, Elia Chamadi, Resort and documented in hundreds of literary departments all over Africa. Kula nuts, palm wines, grandmothers cooking for many kinds of reasons and so on, and so great. Um, and in traveling in Africa, I see people with manuscripts extolling the virtues of the beautiful mother who carries the hopes of Nigeria Delta, which is a part of Nigeria. Um, the perfect maintenance of our ancient traditions and so on. The language um, of dramas and of school festivals. <clears throat> but then anyway, he moves on and says, um, about the same language, are you imposing for others values your own life cannot carry? I speak to myself too about the language he had chosen to employ. Um, so, I mean, he pretty much switched what I was talking about and said, 
why the fuck are you more conservative than the older generation of writers? So I think for Biavanga, the idea for him was beyond just telling a story, beyond pretty much saying what he needed to say, he also felt like on the level of language, he needed to do something. And that is what I, as a writer, pretty much connected to because I was also interested in like, how do you say what you need to say, but how do you say it in a new way, in a way that wasn't quite um, adopted by people who had come um, before Biavanga, the Achibes and the rest of them. So yeah, so for me, um, I, read, I wrote that post because of something I had written at this time. I think the piece, everything is suddenly, in, it was in Granta, high secret. <laughs> Um, it was in Grant at the time. Uh, everything is sorting into an hurricane, something like that, in which his um, use of tenses was pretty much radical. At least we hadn't quite seen it there. And I read it, and I, after reading it, I was like, okay, this is the same guy who had written Discovering Woman, who had written How to Write About Africa in what I consider perfect English and great prose. But somehow he was taking the same language, trying to say, what else, what could I do with it? How can I twist it to embody something more than I needed to say? And for me, that was beyond his politics, which of course became a huge part of why people respected him as in the West. I think looking at him as an African myself, as, as an African writer, I began to understand that beyond the politics, which the West respected him for, I needed to, we needed to hear, respect Biavanga, somebody who had a mastery of the land and of the close form. Wow, <laughs> Horace, thank you. Thank you very much. So in the interest of time, we're going to uh, move straight along. Um, our next speaker is, is Sigrid Rausey. Sigrid is the editor and publisher of Granta Magazine and the publisher of Granta Books. Sigrid, you wrote a moving remembrance of Binyavanga not that long ago. And one of the things you mentioned in that remembrance is uh, something that others of us um, who, who, who don't publish magazines have also been subjected to. But whether you know it or not, you're probably the, the longest standing editor or publisher of Binyavanga from uh, How to Write About Africa to uh, uh, a few years before he died. And, and one of the things that you write about, about getting from him on email and in phone calls is uh, his exercise of a very curious duty. He saw being a writer as producing other writers uh, as much as he saw it as his duty to write words. And what was what was that experience like uh, as you went through it? Thank you, and uh, thank you for being here. It's, I'm so moved by by hearing everybody talk about Binyavanga. He had, I think, everybody's talked about this in one way or another. He had a gift for intimacy. He had a gift for feeling, making you feel that you instantly knew him. Um, he was incredibly generous as a writer. So he took on the responsibility for promoting African literature. And, you know, of course, particularly Kenyan, Nigerian, but actually Africa as a whole. Um, and he sent me many, many proposals for, for his own books, uh, for things like a feminist series of short, short books with queer storylines was one of the projects. And then the last, project for a great African journey when he was already so ill. So this is a great synthesis of everything um, he had worked for. So we published two pieces by one of the writers he introduced us to, uh, Prangaluna Daud, um, pen name. Uh, and one was uh, a eulogy for Seaboy, beautiful story, summer 2016 issue. Um, and then we published Pongalungi's eulogy for Binyavanga in winter 2020. Um, the title of that issue, I have it here, was taken from the piece. There must be, way, there must be ways to organize the world with language. And that was taken directly from uh, Pongalungi's relationship with, with uh, Binyavanga. Um, that text, I want to focus on that because it captures so much of who Binyamanga was, his huge charisma, but also his vulnerability and illness towards the end. Um, so one night they're sitting by a river in Kaduna in Nigeria and they're discussing, this is very Binyamanga, I think, they're discussing the smell of the earth. And Binyavanga is talking about his childhood dreams of becoming a tornado. Uh, and he says, 
I possessed an affinity with chaos. That's why I came to trust language. And then he dives into the water. Um, and I think it was that anarchic spirit in him that spoke to me and spoke to all of us. And I saw him weighed down by illness and that wonderful, but also in a way terrible responsibility to promote other writers. So email after email, piece after piece, and teaching, directing the Shinura Shebesh Center for African Writers and Artists at Bard. I think of Binyavang as being, in a way, prisoner of his own conscience. He did unquestionably a great thing, but what was the price that he paid in terms of his own writing? Um, I, it, it's complicated. It was so laudable, but also, you know, it must have taken so much time. And to become a spokesperson in the way that he did, I, I think it's a very, it's a very complicated thing. So how to write about Africa, I, I have it here. Uh, Binyavanga's most famous piece published in Granta 92, um, winter 2005. So this is not just his most famous piece. It is also by far Granta's most read and cited piece of all times. Um, we re reprinted it for our anniversary issue a couple of years ago. Um, it's satire, and I was very surprised when I read uh, Binguni, how similar in tone it was. Um, so it's the same playful, affectionate voice, the same sense of distance and intimacy mixed, very much his tone. Um, and I'm thinking maybe there was something about precisely that youthful, playful voice that just slightly buckled under the burden of illness and responsibility. I'm not in any way suggesting weakness. I'm just suggesting what is the responsibility for African writers for Africa? What is that responsibility? What is it to be virtuous in that setting? Uh, and by the way, I don't want us to forget about his book either, which published by Granta. One day I will write about this place, uh, published in 2011. Um, very important memoir. Much was concealed in that memoir, of course. Um, childhood, adulthood, and, and also, you know, it's about troubled love. And that is, that is what I think Binyavanga was all about, you know, in one way or another. Thank you. Gosh, absolutely, Sigrid. And um, yes, you did You did capture something lovely, which is I think many of us, including Yvonne, who's uh, going to speak next, were also uh, urging him to write more um, and, at, and, and urging him sometimes to spend less time um, mm -hmm. getting us to write. Certainly something that was complicated, but generous and wonderful. Next up is Yvonne Adiambo Awar. Um, Yvonne is an award-winning writer from Nairobi in Kenya. Uh, she is the author of the novels Dust and The Dragonfly Sea. Yvonne, um, you are our last speaker. And in so many ways, I think the arc of your relationship with Binyavanga and what he meant to you uh, from being a friend to a mentor, to a companion, to a critic, he was a lot. And, uh, and so maybe you can take us to the finish uh, by, by telling us what you thought when you read Binguni and how that affected you uh, and how he affected you. Hey, um, I'm, going to, uh, I'm, I'm going to try to be brave. Like I think each one of you, um, I, I struggle. I still struggle with talking about him in the past. I, I apologize. <laughs> Uh, okay. Um, Sigrid, you talked about his gift for intimacy and his um, and the sense that you felt that um, uh, you felt like you knew him. More more important was his uh, the capacity 
he had this capacity right from the time I met him. Uh, I felt that I was known. I felt that I was known. And uh, it's very rare that you run into people like those. Uh, I, I don't know about you guys, but it, it's, it's extremely rare. But not only was I known, um, he midwifed, um, he midwifed the, uh, the gift that was so hidden within me. Uh, he believed in me as a writer um, long, long before I even believed in myself as a writer. Uh, he refused to let me uh, rest in my laurels. He dragged me out of the corporate spaces that I had found refuge in. Uh, when I was in Zanzibar uh, doing the Zanzibar Film Festival, uh, he came for the final, fe the third year I was, yeah, you know, we had a very successful festival and I remember him coming up to me and saying, Yvonne, this is your last year here. Get the hell out of here. You're going back now to write. Uh, and uh, oddly enough, I did. Uh, but that had been the nature of our relationship uh, right from the start. Um, he, he was Ganesh. Uh, breaks down uh, boulders and mountains. He never compromised. Uh, he never allowed us to wallow in our, uh, uh, you know, uh, you know, in 2002, after he won the Kane Prize, uh, that was my first encounter with his name. And I remember when Anne McCreeth hosted an event, a few of us just went to that event to stare at him, to stare at this phenomenon. Um, and uh, at that time, we created a whole list of our, you know, why we were not writing, why we're not creating. And basically, he said, screw that. Uh, it refused to allow us to, to, to sit with that particular excuse and said, look, uh, uh, the, the world is ours for the taking. Uh, you know, you, you, you know, jump, 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 jump ahead of the gatekeepers uh, and, uh, and, and open the doorway of, in a very strange way, even though it was there before us, uh, the computer, the, the internet, the, the creation. I mean, my, the, the weight of whispers, the book, uh, the story that won the Kane Prize the, the, the following year after him was first published through, uh, uh, you know, uh, was first published online. And, and, and you know, he, does, he, he had this capacity to, to uh, how do you say, it? To, to not only swallow the world, but then to redesign the world in his image and likeness and, and draw everybody uh, into, that, into the, the vision, the horizon that he had uh, imagined, not just for himself, but for each one of us. Um, uh, you know, the, the Weight of Whispers, the, the, the story Weight of Whispers, which I, it was the first story I ever, ever wrote. Um, um, he, he, he saw the story long before I did. I'd written something before that. And then he gave me, he called and then he said, Yvonne, uh, the, which is a, it was a nonfiction piece. He says, Yvonne, I expect a, a fiction, I, I expect a piece of fiction from you. I, I didn't know what, I, I didn't even know there was a piece of fiction in me. And then he proceeded to call me every hour. And I do not lie when I say it. I wrote Weight of Whispers just to get Pinyavanga off my back because he'd even call at 3 a.m. and say, Yvonne, is the story ready? Um, so that's, that, that, and you know, that is, uh, that's Pinyavanga, the Pied, Pied Piper, that's Pinyavanga, the midwife, that's Pinyavanga, the prophet. There's, there, there's another Pinyavanga. There's Pinyavanga, the, uh, I call, uh, almost sarcastically, I call, it, I call him Pinyavanga Kanda Bongo Man. Uh, I, that, that's because after uh, I'd resigned from the, uh, the Zanzibar Film Festival, uh, he was doing the, uh, the Lit Fest, the Kwadi Lit Fest. And uh, you, know how, how, you know how it started. I know each one of us was caught up in this, uh, in this capacity, this mesmerizing capacity, where he'd say, oh, um, he, he told me, just come in, just come in for a few hours, just to look at the, just look at the, uh, the setup and, and give some ideas. Uh, and that was the idea. And I told myself, just go in a few minutes, look at the setup, give some ideas and get out. That was not to be, I ended up, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know co co co-producing the, the Lit Fest at no pri at, at my own expense, mind you, and, and sarcastically, there were a few of us who said, you know, we, how does he do it? And we were sarcastically calling ourselves Binya Vanga Let's. That's why I said call him the Kanda Bungo Man, Binya Vanga. Um, there is, uh, 
there's Binyavanga the barometer. Barometer, the Binyavanga the the barometer. Binyavanga the the patriot. Binyavanga who shows up in the middle of our post-election violence at our gates, at each one of our gates, summoning us. I remember uh, when we were huddling when our country was burning. Uh, car, you know, a car's horn at the gate. You go up. I go. I'll go to the gate, and there's been your vanga, and his words were simply, "You, you, you're effing well not going to sit down here when our country is aflame. Get your things. We are going." Um, and that's how a few of us ended up go, ended going, you know, going to Eldoret uh, at the at the epicenter of the of, of the violence, and uh, we were very foolish. Uh, but we were very strangely brave because Pina Vanga made that uh, possible. Um, we should have asked why we were the only two cars on the highway at that time, but it, it never occurred for, to us to do so. Um, and there's, uh, there's then Pina Vanga, the, 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 one, the one who was always lighting a fire up my butt, literally. Uh, just to let me be complacent, two stories. One was dust, uh, writing dust, and then I'll end. Um, and you know, the first time I wrote it, the first, the first piece, the first, uh, the first draft, uh, presented it to him, and he would always call, Ivan, I want to see what you're doing right now. You know, send me the stuff. So I did, and he said he looked at it, called me up, and you know, kind of there was this, I called him the Binyavanga summons. I show up, and then he says, Ivan, this is shit. <laughs> um, start again. And I did, and I did. Um, uh, he, was, he, was, he was my barometer. Before anything, uh, before I allowed work out, uh, it would pass through him. Uh, and uh, when I got his imprimatur, um, there was a kind of certainty that this was okay. Um, there is a, a, let me talk about pilgrimages. He, uh, the pilgrimages project which he put together, he specifically sent me to the DRC because he said I needed to get rid of my barbiness. <laughs> he assumed that. <laughs> he, he, he believed. <laughs> he believed that. <laughs> he believed that. Um, the DRC in Kinshasa uh, would uh, would shake my spirit, would shake my soul, <laughs> and allow me to enter into some realm of darkness. <laughs> um, I, well, yeah, well, I I enjoyed the trip immensely, <laughs> more than I think he expected. <laughs> uh, but yes. Uh, I don't know. I could go on and on and on. I I wouldn't. I, I mean, I, I had I had a very, a very I had very clear notes about what I was going to say. Um, um, Bingoni for me is the. Um, it, it's, uh, you know, a child when you sent it and I read it, uh, there was a kind of very uncanny feeling. The the certainty of little pieces, uh, little puzzles, little riddles falling into place. I don't know if I can put words into what came together within, um, but the, the sense of, ah, I, I get it, but I'm not quite sure I know what it is that I now get. Um, but yeah, thank you for that. And, and like you, um, I'm still not ready to talk to about him in the past tense. I hear him. <laughs> um, he, he's, he, he'll always be part of my life. Yeah, absolutely, Ivan. Um, and I think uh, one of the things we were, when I uh, first I saw the story, you know, I sent it to him. He wanted it edited. He wanted it published. And then he died, and so we couldn't do that. After he died, uh, I spoke to James and Shiron Chiki, and they, they wanted it out. When I when I read it again, I, I don't know how to describe this, but it was like getting a letter from him after he was dead. I don't, you know, it was it was like exactly a something like it's that. It's exactly was, exactly the most uncanny thing, but it really felt. I, it just was a very intense kind of thrilling experience, you know, it's, it's as though, you know, like by mistake, you know, something had happened and something had bended in time and space and uh, uh, it was it was really incredible. Uh, oh, Ivan, well, glad you made it back from Kinshasa. <laughs> <Good>. <laughs> no. 
Um, Adam, um, I'm, I'm now going to introduce Adam Tew, who's going to close us out. Uh, Adam McGee is the arts editor and the managing editor of the Boston Review, and really, in many ways, the reason we're here. Um, Adam, I'm not sure there's enough time for questions, but would you like to um, say something before we, before we end this magical, beautiful session that I, I don't know how to describe? I know, it's been such a pleasure. Um, I, uh, I've had a lot of, um, a fun listening, but also it was just an incredibly moving experience to hear so many of you who knew him talk about um, his influence. I, I mean, it, it, what I've heard over and over again, when, I, when we started planning this event, I received so many emails and text messages from people saying, oh, telling me stories about what he had done for them, um, you know, helping them with everything from academic dissertations to stories that they were working on, his generosity. Um, one person wrote to tell me how much he loved Cape Verdean music, which I had no idea, you know, mm -hmm. and how he had helped her with a project that she was working on about that. And, um, and what comes up again and again is just his generosity, the amount of time that he was willing to give to other artists and thinkers. Um, it was such a delight to be able to include the story in, in our issue, Ancestors. Um, and uh, I hope that if you enjoyed this event, you'll go over to bostonreview.net. Uh, everything that we, we do ends up there for free. You don't have to log in or anything. Um, and uh, there's so much wonderful writing. If you uh, are at all interested in what we're doing, you can sign up for our newsletter and get information about what we're doing. It's for free. Um, you can, you know, donate any amount. You can become a member. Um, you can uh, give a gift of it to someone else. There's all sorts of ways to be engaged, but you can also just always read us for free and that's always gonna be true. So hopefully you'll at least head over there to take a look at what we're doing. Um, I don't know, we might have three or four minutes. I, I don't think I'm necessary here. I unmuted everyone and I think you all would probably have a lot of fun talking to each other. Um, so maybe, you know, just until 1.15, you know, if anybody else has a question for someone else on the panel, I think that would be a lot of fun just to hear you talk to each other. I have loads of questions if people are feeling stumped, but I really doubt that's going to be the case with this group. So. I think I went ahead and unmuted all of the presenters and um, I don't know, does anybody have anything they want to, to add or ask someone else? Um, I do, I think. Yeah. Yeah, so I have something I want to add, but I also have a question I want to ask as well. Um, so I wanted to add something about um, Binguni. Um, I wanted to say that there are two things I think weren't quite uh, said a lot about Biavanga while he was alive. Uh, what is, think, did, uh, is, your, is your video off? You can put your video on, then we can see. Um, it's on here. How about now? Not on for us. No. Maybe try stopping the video and then I'll invite you to start it again. Oh, there it is. Yes, oh, there you are. Okay. Okay. There you are. Oh, great. Um, yeah, so I was saying, um, there are two things I don't think were pretty much said about Biafranca's writing when he was alive. Um, I think the two things are, uh, one, I think of him as a, I mean, as I said earlier, as a stylist, and also as, uh, as a humorist. I think Biafranca was a very mm. funny person, <laughs> person, and also a writer as well, you know. Uh, but somehow, a lot of, because like I said, because, of the, because the focus um, from the West was pretty much uh, his politics. It meant that those two qualities are pretty much, I don't know, hidden somewhat. But I think anybody who's read him probably had to have chuckled, you know, once or twice uh, <laughs> you know, what he was writing about and how he was writing about it. And I think this is true for Bingoni as well. I mean, I read Bingoni and I was like, ah, you know, all of what I thought about him much later, the the seeds were already there um, as early as 96, which is when I think it was published. Um, so for me, it was quite remarkable that um, Yavanga pretty much, even as he grew, he never quite, uh, I guess, forgot where he pretty much started from in terms of his art. So yeah, funny guy and also a stylist. And I, and I wish a lot more would be said um, about that. That's what mm -hmm. I want to ask. What I wanted to ask was, um, Sigrid, uh, was it, I mean, I, I keep thinking that it must have been quite hilarious to have received uh, how to write about Africa. Were, were, you in, were you the one who received it directly at the time? 
How to write about Africa was was before my time. Uh, wow. It came about because, uh, I mean, this is the story I heard. So Ian Jack was the editor then, um, and they published one issue on Africa. Binyamanga apparently wrote in to complain about the issue because there weren't <laughs> enough, quite rightly, there weren't enough African writers in an issue about Africa. Um, and out of that letter of complaint, which Ian thought was brilliantly written, the piece came, you know, so Ian can <laughs> write the piece. Uh, so that's, that's how that happened. Matt Wieland, uh, who was maybe assisting Ian Jack at that time, I think helped compile the piece out of Binivanga's several inflamed, uh, outrageous emails. <laughs> Outraged emails, I think, yes. Yeah. All right. There's a really, um, you know, Ashan knows, I'm sure most of us probably know, there's that great kind of second edition to How to Write About Africa that Bedoum published. Yes. In, in 2009 yeah. or 10 or something. And yeah. Google's How to Write About Africa, volume two, Bedoum magazine, and you can find it. It's a great, great, great piece and tells the story of how it came about, along with a lot of really interesting kind of bizarre intersecting jokes and, and zingers in there. Really, really great piece. One of my favorites. <laughs> and I forgot to say also, Yvonne, you came to us by Binyavanga, didn't you? I, I, I oh. absolutely. And you did. Yes, right? yes. I, I came to you guys through through Binyavanga. Gosh, I got my entire literary, um, you know, life career is has been through Binya. So, yeah. yeah. Uh, and brilliant book, and I remember the folio nomination and <laughs> everything. Yes, yes, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. There's some good news around the corner. Uh, it's not it's not final as yet, but there will be likely uh, at least one and possibly two anthologies of Binyavanga's work that might be produced at some point mm -hmm. uh, later in the year and in the next, which uh, I think will be lovely because there's so much that even those of us who knew him well don't know of in terms of his writing, simply because it was so scattered across so many different countries and venues and and times uh, that some of it some of it is is just very surprising. I think even to people who knew him, um, and I'm very excited uh, that mm -hmm. there might be these anthologies, and I look forward to uh, making trying to make them happen. Yeah, yeah. that's wonderful. You know, something I, maybe uh, I can just uh, Secret, I know you were talking earlier about emails that you've received. I'm wondering, uh, Charles, is there a way to compile these? You know, that's exactly what I was telling you, right, yesterday. And so this is the thing, because I don't delete anything. I use Thunderbird. I have Linux. I have, you know, an insane amount of space uh, just by accident. I mean, I don't keep mm. things because I want to, but I, it's just too much trouble to delete them. So I have literally every email you send me. And if you have emails as well, because he did so much of his writing on email like that in personal correspondence. And yes. um, if there's something worth preserving, you know, um, I've got about, maybe we should, we should try to yeah. use it. Some, and yeah, if that's something that you have or Sigrid or anyone else or is- I'll Centralize it, yeah. Something with yeah, it. Yeah. I also guarantee you that some university would be interested in having um, an archive of those that that's something to think about trying to do actually yes i think that's something that we should speak to somebody about i think that he was a careless archivist in general you know <laughs> and he was careless in general right? like i think you know i uh, i mean he had really a, 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 just a remarkable lack of that kind of survival skill i suppose which also i think added to the charm um uh look i think we've gone on long enough though um let's look at the time um Thank you, you know, to those of you who came, uh, so grateful, really appreciate it. Um, as you can see, this was somewhat emotional for a lot of us as well. Um, um, Neo, anything that you'd like to say since you started us off? Yeah. To us? Um, I think as, as, a, as a political thing that I want to do, Binyavanga was gay and we can't end this conversation without mentioning the fact that he was a gay person in Africa and in Kenya. So that's it. Yeah. Very good. Yeah. Yeah. What a lovely note to end on. Here, here.
Thank can you, I, everybody. Uh, there just, will be a recording of this available. Um, and, uh, and if you want to keep track of that, we'll send an email to everyone who registered through Eventbrite when that's live. Um, and we'll also put it on Boston Review's website. And if the Against Nature Journal has a way of posting it, we'll make sure that you have, um, have it posted for your channel as well. Um, yeah. so people will be able to watch this again. Thank you uh, for just also on my side. Uh, I, I was already so grateful to be able to, um, that we were able to publish this. But after this talk, it feels I, like I, I'm really humbled uh, and grateful because this Binguni piece now feels even more like a shared, uh, something shared really among um, our, us. So, um, and the Boston Review and all of you. And um, yes, yeah, so. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Take Thank care. You. Thank you for doing Love this. You. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank all you. For Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye, Bye. Bye everyone. Bye. Bye. Bye.